Good morning. Okay, so it, thanks Tracy and thanks to my uh, co-PIs here for getting this thing on the road. It seems to everyone in this room and it seems to me now looking at this that this was all organized and planned and we knew what we were doing going in. That's completely far from the truth, but it, it, it started essentially why you all are in this room. It's probably because you're doing something that's fun. You know, we're in a, in a uh, discipline that enables us to prof pursue a profession that we decide is, is for some reason, uh, interesting. Um, my, my work, I, I'm a, a wind engineer and I, I come from the Caribbean, I come from Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, a lot of this work has, to me, the, the, the essence of being on an island, being able to uh, seek uh, your own security after a natural hazard. Okay? Um, I started back in the 1990s looking at work because there was this issue of Hurricane uh, Gilbert, 1988 in Jamaica, that destroyed 60,000 houses. Okay? 60,000 families that uh, were suffering and they didn't know why. Uh, the next year, Hurricane Hugo did the same thing in Montserrat, whereby 90% of the people, 11,000 on that island, had no homes to go back to. South Carolina, the end of it, again, another 60,000 houses, 12,000 mobile homes were completely destroyed in Hurricane Hugo. Okay, and that's when I went to Clemson, uh, 1993, to get uh, going on this work. Um, 125,000 houses in uh, South Florida were destroyed. Okay. Two things came to mind was that we're looking always at housing. Why is housing such an issue? And we call them the non-engineered sector. That means that essentially no one in this room was involved. Uh, we would like to say we were involved in housing in, in terms of uh, you know, building codes, etc. But for the most part, engineered housing structural systems do not yet exist. And so, moving along in my career, we, we had that uh, seminal year in uh, 2011 of two tornadoes back to back, 27th of April and 20th of May, uh, hitting Tuscaloosa and Joplin. And Again, we investigated this for a very simple process. I had a colleague, John Vanderlint, who actually lived in Tuscaloosa at the time, and we said, road trip, let's just go there. Let's just go find out, okay? For us in Florida, we could not believe that, you know, in 2011, people are still losing so many houses since we had solved that, or we thought we had solved that in 1992 after Hurricane Andrew. But for some reason, the essence of the work that we do stayed within the domain, within the silo of our research, and it did not get transferred for whatever reason to those communities in Alabama and uh, Missouri. Again, you're looking at $7 billion in, in damages and over uh, 12,000 houses completely destroyed. On the fatality side, there were nearly 500 fatalities in just two of about 500 tornadoes that happened. This was a bumper year. 1,700 uh, tornadoes happened in 2011. Put that in perspective, the largest tornado fatality, the most damaging, was the, the 20, 1925 tornado that killed 695 people. So, you know, just personally, it's an affront to me that, uh, you know, 70 years later, we're still having this issue of uh, uh, that many fatalities for problems that we can solve. Within that year, there was this, this larger perspective that it's not just about tornadoes, David. It's not just about hurricanes. Okay, we we did have that tsunami in in uh, Japan. 
We did have that Christchurch earthquake. Many of you uh, presented uh, and you know went out there and did your due diligence to uh, resolve what was going on. So there is this worldwide push. So uh, you know at that stage we're starting to ask ourselves, well, why? What are we doing? If we're publishing papers, but it's not affecting change, it's not improving our communities, what good is this so-called civil structural wind engineering? So, you know, and again, the, the essence of that 1925 tri-state tornado was that the majority of the structures that damaged were the housing non-engineered structures, okay? We see the same patterns over and over again, and therefore, stair, in my mind, was uh, how do we resolve to change what uh, needs to fix? For us in the tornado world, 1970, the Lubbock tornado was a seminal work. This uh, project by uh, Meta, McDonald, and uh, Marshall uh, uh, extends to about uh, 450 pages and it essentially uh, set the tone for forensic engineering work for structural wind engineers uh, into the future. Essentially, you get a map, you in identify on that map the major uh, uh, studies, uh, infrastructure that's at risk, and then we, we get some idea of how that, uh, the damage works, you know, from extreme damage to uh, minor damage and so on and so forth, okay? We haven't changed anything yet. We're, we're still doing the same things. We identify in that, this particular report, we've identified 93 case studies. And this was the, the content of the map at that time. This is how uh, the work was done. We all recognize what, what this is. The essence of the change that has been made with STAIR is essentially we've moved from black and white to color. So that's, that's an improvement, right? Um, but there is an underlying problem that uh, after, in 1970, we identified that the maximum wind speed possible in that very uh, uh, dangerous tornado was 200 miles per hour, and that most of the structures damaged were damaged by winds 75 to 125 miles per hour, well within our ability to design for that. It has taken us another 70 years to come up with a design for tornado resilient structures, which was pu published in 19, in ASE 716, two years ago. The work continues in the same way. We form committees. Um, we meet over maps uh, and uh, look at the, the details that we have. We establish transects across the, the area of, of concern. Um, and we use this, for us, was one of the greatest uh, changes in how we did stuff, okay? It was geolocated photographs. It seems simple that we were able to take 14,000 photographs for uh, uh, seven, I think 7,000 structures and we were able to digest that perhaps in about two weeks, okay? Um, today, it seems like this is par for the course, but you know, this is why a lot of the work has not been able to be shared outside with everybody very quickly, okay? Like I say, these were the maps. The first maps that we placed up there was done at uh, University of Alabama, and um, like I say, it was in color major change, but it was done by a, a group, a collective working on individual machines and, uh, you know, pooled into a single server uh, for immediate use and immediate dissemination. Uh, what we were able to do with that simple change was change a photograph into a data point. Data points enabled us to analyze things better. It enabled us to generate uh, solutions and codes 
and so we're now actually getting things moving forward. Um, the other thing that we realized is there is no need for us to wait until uh, we are two to three years out for a peer-reviewed publication to get the information back to the community that has been affected. Okay? Communities rebuild immediately. So therefore, if we have information in this room on how to build an earthquake resilient structure, how to rebuild a tornado resilient school, that community needs to know it now. Our reports are self-published and our reports get uh, shared with the, the respective communities, the building officials, and anyone who will listen at that uh, particular time. We also decided to use uh, the uh, preliminary damage assessment reports so that we can uh, do exactly what Tracy says. Even if we're not in the field physically, we can virtually get there and train new engineers, new natural hazards, uh, researchers and forensic engineers to do exactly what we're doing. Um, we cannot solve this problem by ourselves, but we can do so by training others to uh, help us. Disasters are quiet. You all who have been in the field know this. It is very quiet when you're walking around a building, no one is around, and this is what you see. This is Joplin, Missouri. The uh, regional hospital is in the background. That's a 10-story building. Who do we speak for? Those buildings, they have no voice. We are the voice of those structures, the infrastructure. We need to step up and say what this building is doing. This is another uh, building in, in Haiti, the nursing uh, facility which was damaged in 2016, Hurricane Matthew. This is a health facility which survived. It was built and it survives. So there is not just uh, the stories of uh, failures, but there is also the stories of successes, and it is through the efforts of the state and your uh, continuing work that we are going to be able to uh, make those successes more uh, prevalent. So ultimately, this is what we're about. This community is about mitigation. We want to ensure that buildings actually do have a chance to survive, and we get that by learning, by listening to that quiet of those buildings and seeing what it is and then sharing that information. And this is where we, uh, we get to. We share this information not just with that community but with our research students and our fellows in this room. And um, it is through this and the next generation that we're actually going to get uh, the solutions we're looking for. So with that, I pass you on to uh, Dr. David Roosh here. This was, Dave, this is your uh, hurricane, uh, uh, this was Joplin maybe, and he will uh, conclude with the data curation. 